the hour. So I let's kick it off. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the session, Can Companies Electrify Their Supply Chains? I'm Sarah Goldman. I am the energy analyst at GreenBiz, and I'm also the co-chair of Verge Electrify. And so when it comes to decarbonization of supply chains, here's what I know. About a third of emissions are from industrial processes, and we must address these in order to have a chance at addressing climate change. And here's the problem. Many of these industrial emissions are buried in company supply chains, meaning that the companies that make the emissions are generally not the companies that you and I have heard of. And they're also not the companies that are selling the materials to the consumer facing companies. So it's sort of hard to figure out where to start to untangle this Gordian knot. There's like the companies that are wanting to start to decarbonize their supply chains don't have a lot of options available to them right now. And meanwhile, the companies that are making the materials may not have the demand signals to be innovating new options for them. So it kind of creates these gaps in the market and in the technology and in the policy to figure out where do we really begin with all of this. Where I'm hopeful is that we're starting to have these conversations. And if you heard the keynotes this morning, Jane Flegel, who is heading up industrial missions in the in, in the Biden White House, I almost said Obama White House, that's was sort of a time travel moment. The Biden White House is, and she is the very first person in this role. This is a new position that's been created for industrial decarbonization. And so it shows that this is becoming something that we are more aware of, but we're still really early on in figuring out how to do this. So I'm pleased to welcome these two experts to walk through this. Kate Height, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Mission Possible Partnership, and she's also a principal at RMI, and Rasmus Blanco, who is the Managing Director of Systems Transformation at We Mean Business. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Sarah. And I really love your electricity earrings. They're amazing. <laughs> so I would like to frame today's conversation of the first one is, where are we on the path to addressing industrial emissions? The second is, what are the emerging strategies to address industrial emission within supply chains? And finally, where can organizations get started? So to start out with that first question, where are we right now? I would love to turn it over to Kate and hear a little bit about where's, what's the state of play right now? What's going on with industrial emissions? Sure, thanks, Sarah. I'm glad to be here with all of you today and with my colleague Rasmus, and with whom we work very closely at RMI. Um, so industrial emissions, I think that, you know, as you stated, actually having a position in the, the new White House focused on this issue is indicative of this new kind of frontier that we have reached in addressing this problem. I think for a long time, industrial emissions have sort of been the third rail of climate policy, right? There's there have been a lot of competitiveness concerns. It's really hard. They use a lot of fuel and high heat processes. But we're now at a point where we do have some solutions and we are able to think really critically about how we electrify a lot of industrial operations. There are still some high heat processes, those that, for example, um, cement kilns, those that um, are doing primary steel production that we do not yet have commercially available solutions for. Um, but for a lot of the other things that happen, we are able to use electricity right now. So I think that now is a really interesting time to bring together the activity that's happening in increased renewable energy deployment. And a lot of power companies are thinking about, okay, I foresee this new demand coming from industry. It's a lot of demand, right? So how can we marry together that industrial demand with the build out of the renewable energy system? Oh, you're on mute. The last couple of years, there have been so many organizations that have been coming forward with new net zero goals. And I'm curious how net zero goals fit into the path to decarbonize industry. And when we're talking about net zero goals, how often it includes these, the full value chain and the scope three emissions. Um, so, so I would, would love, love to hear from Rasmus and see, and see where we can think about net zero and all this. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, I mean, the 
the idea of reducing emissions and addressing climate change isn't exactly new, right? Um, but we have to remember that the system we're trying to transform is absolutely massive. I mean, our whole economic system is predicated on a certain way of doing things. And so it takes time to change these things. And what we've seen is that, um, you know, a lot of the companies who have wanted to be ambition, you know, they've, they've started from the simple stuff, you know, uh, start by measuring, then reporting, um, you know, being transparent about where your emissions are and then starting to try to tackle the problem first within your fence line, so your scope one emissions, then discussing with your power suppliers, you know, so your scope two emissions. And then the last step really um, in that, that, that journey of trying to figure out where your emissions are and addressing them is that scope three piece. And, um, you know, I think that the business context within which companies are operating today um, has evolved to a point where, you know, to be credible um, and to be showing that you're doing your part in terms of uh, tackling climate challenges, um, you have to be aiming for a net zero objective. Um, it's not good enough to reduce your emissions 10% or 20% or 30%. Um, right now, I think the gold standard really is to say that you want to be net zero well before year 2050, and that um, even you know um, the leaders at the moment are saying they're going all in. They want to have halved all their emissions by 2030, and that includes scope one, two, and three. And scope three is the hard one, really, um, for the simple reason that it, it's you just can't get hold of the data sometimes from your suppliers because they need to go to their suppliers to get the data, who need to go to their suppliers. And we have very long and complex you know, global value chains. Um, so even just wrapping your head around, like, where should I start? Where is, like, the 80% of my emissions coming from? Um, so I can start working on that. But the great thing is that, you know, companies have started, leaders have taken action, and you have some great, you know, supply chain collaboration going on. Um, but there's some really fundamental, you know, difficulties at the moment still, just in terms of the simple stuff like measuring and having comparable data from one company to the next. Um, but as Kate pointed out, you know, this is, um, you know, we've gone from a decade where I think it was all about energy and electrification and renewables. And now this next decade, or I'd say maybe eight years to 2030, right, now is about those scope three emissions, about industrial emissions. So how can we piggyback on the great stuff that's already out there? So how can we use more electricity from renewable sources, so electrifying, um, but at the same time, like turning our attention to the harder parts of the problem, which are maybe further down in the value chain, where you have to you know, have conversations you maybe didn't have before with your suppliers or you know, even like tier two, tier three suppliers. Um, and I think this is a really exciting space really now as well, because you're starting to see these, these groups of companies coming together on these value chains, recognizing they can't do it on their own. They have to like have everybody in each stage kind of doing their part to make this happen. So I want to be clear about what we're talking about when we're talking about industrial emissions. So I broadly think about the emissions in industrial processes to be divided into three groups. One of them is the direct emissions, the you know, burning of fossil fuels on site for the steel smelting or the cement, what's it called, roller kiln, the cement kiln. Yep. Um, and then there's also the, the emissions associated with the electricity used. I consider that more about creating the grid, creating the grid, and that's more or less how we can decarbonize that, that of those emissions. The third one is process emissions. And those are the emissions that are just being released as part of the process of these industrial processes. So one of the things you mentioned, Kate, at the top is this idea of cement. My understanding is when it comes to cement, because it's made from limestone, there's a they, within the process, they, it releases a tremendous amount of CO2. And there's not, we're working on ways to get around that, but that bucket of emissions is approximately 60% of the emissions associated with cement. So we're having this conversation within the context of a conference about electrification. But electrification isn't the only thing, or the only part of decarbonizing these industrial processes. So I'm curious how we should be thinking about how much electrification is able to solve and how much we should be thinking of this as reimagining the process, the, te the technological process overall to be reaching that deeper decarbonization. Can you do any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And Sarah, just FYI, you're really crackly. I don't know if it's your headphones or, or having a hard time picking up your, your signal. Thanks. Um, but yes, so I think that something that's really important to think about here. So so the, the team that I work on, the Mission Possible Partnership, of which we mean business as a partner, is, is sort of considering how we can activate this sort of ecosystem of industry, right? So that's bringing the industry together with those who provide financing to industry, with those who are demanding the products from industry, um, in addition to the governments, right, who are kind of setting the rules of the game here. And I think that um, one of the things that we can't count out in those conversations as we are thinking about what the roadmap looks like for industrial transformation in some of these hard to abate sectors, including cement, steel, aluminum, chemicals, um, is the potential for kind of technology breakthroughs and the ability to adopt new ways of doing things that are going to enable us to sort of leapfrog things, sort of in the way that in the renewable energy context, we see a lot of renewable energy deployed in nations that have very mature grids. Um, but now in some nations that do not have as mature of grids, they're able to sort of leapfrog things. So rather than running on fossil, they're going right to renewable energy. So I think we can't count out those opportunities and they need to certainly be part of the equation. But the the truth is that these assets that these companies are investing in have very, very long lifetimes, right? 50 years, we're talking. And it the economics and absence of an exorbitant carbon price are really not there right now for them to retire these assets in the near term and just put all new, better stuff in place, even if those technologies are available. So we need to really think about this on two parallel tracks. So first, when you have an opportunity to invest in new assets, a lot of the electrically powered assets are cost competitive with those that are fueled by fossil fuels. So that is a good decision to make if you have the opportunity to invest in new in some operations. But for those assets that are already running on fossil-based fuels, the important thing to think about is substitution. What kind of fuel can you substitute that you're maybe burning coal right now? Can you substitute natural gas that's controlling from methane emissions associated with its sort of you know, distribution and processing? Are you able to substitute hydrogen if it's available in your area? And hydrogen is an area that, you know, also thinking about the electricity sector, it is an area of a, a really a lot of great potential, but also is a little bit of a chicken and the egg, right? We need to have more demand for hydrogen so more people will produce hydrogen and we can bring the price down. So I would say, you know, when it comes to decarbonizing the industrial sector, it's really a, an all hands on deck approach here. But the important thing to recognize is that even though we have some long lived assets that are in play right now, that we do need to retire over time and we need to accelerate the retirement of those as the costs come down for the new technologies that companies are available to invest in. We cannot ignore the emissions that are currently coming from those assets and help them source fuels that are lower emitting so that we can at least mitigate to some extent the impact in terms of emissions from those assets. I mean, can I add to that, Kate, just the point that um, I think we're there's a lot of scope still to electrify the processes. It's not just about the, the process emissions. Um, the, the the piece of with, which interests me actually, like when, when we've been thinking about these, like I, I worked for a chemical company before this, right? And we were looking at our assets, um, we realized that, okay, well, in theory, we could electrify some of these, you know, boilers, for example, or some of these, um, you know, chemical processes. But the problem was that nobody done it before, right? Or somebody done it, but on a different process, on a different site, in a different location with different kind of setup. And so, I think where a lot of companies are right now is that they recognize, they see that it's going to be cheaper to run their processes on electricity rather than going to, for example, biogas or something like that. And so now is the time when you have to make your first thing. How would this work in practice, right? These kind of demo plants almost. And, and the technology is already proven, but have you built it for your individual company, your individual process? And so with these demos that are going to probably be popping up like left, right and center between now and 2030, we need to be in place by 2030 when we're ready, when we can also expect the price of renewable power to be relatively cheap uh, to be able to make a wholesale shift into those. And don't forget, it's not just about direct electrification. As Kate pointed out, it, you know, it's also electrification through hydrogen, through, through synthetic fuels as well. Thanks for that. Um, I refreshed. Is can you hear me any better now? How's 
better. Good. I'm going to be can understand you, but, yeah. Okay, I'll keep going. Sorry for the, sorry for the challenges. Um, so clearly this isn't, there's a lot going into this problem. There's a lot of challenges here and a lot of different elements that need to be addressed, a lot of different um, players that need to be operating together. And I want to move on to the second question, which is to help address industrial chain. And I know both of you are working on this right now. Um, Kate, I'd love to turn it over to you and hear about what working strategies you are seeing. Sure. Um, well, this is really what we're trying to tackle through the, the Mission Possible Partnership. And Sarah, it may be useful just to show a couple of slides to illustrate this. If you can put the one up that has that kind of flywheel diagram. Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, the conversation around industrial decarbonization is really primed right now because the entire ecosystem of stakeholders necessary for that move is, is ready to engage, right? This is not only going to take steel mills making actions happen. They can't take those actions unless they have a supportive environment in terms of policy, in terms of demand for green steel and the financing that's available to support it, right? So that's really the approach that we need to take right now. And I think that we're seeing in the US government um, in the European Commission as well, there's a lot of movement afoot to consider how we can move the industrial decarbonization um, conversation forward. Um, another thing that I think is really important to point out is you know, industrial emissions comprise, as you mentioned, Sarah, 30% of global emissions right now. If sort of business continues as usual, right, those sectors, those few industrial sectors that we're talking about here, so the ones that we address through Mission Possible are cement, aluminum, steel, um, chemicals, and then we have the heavy transport, so trucking, shipping, and aviation. Those seven sectors alone will eat up the entire carbon budget within this decade that we have to remain below 1.5 degrees. So, so inaction is not an option. And I think that people are increasingly realizing this. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged to see those next steps in the conversation happening. And what we're trying to activate through the partnership is to really run these industries through what we call a four-step process. So the first step of the process being, of course, getting together that critical mass of that ecosystem that I mentioned for each of the sectors but then getting industry to agree on what the roadmap is going to be for that individual sector going out to 2050, right? So right now, there may be a number of different roadmaps out there for a number of different sectors. We are endeavoring here to really have the best in class industry backed roadmap that we can then encourage the other stakeholders in the ecosystem to pin their actions to. So if we see a trajectory for steel and what needs to happen in steel in terms of policy, technology adoption, et cetera, over the next couple of decades. Then we have a pathway where we can implement supportive policy to make sure that happens. The finance community understands what sort of investments it needs to make, what sort of things it needs to divest from. And customers also can make commitments to that roadmap to say, look, I'm gonna demand X tons of green steel going out to 2030 to make sure that I'm really helping stimulate the market. So moving from that step two of the process where we get that industry-backed roadmap is step three where we have these commitments, right? So individual companies, governments, finance, demand, all committing to do their part to move solutions forward for these hard to abate industries. And I think key underpinning this is a, a, an item that, that Rasmus just hit on, the traceability and the ability to hold companies who are making these commitments accountable. We have no shortage of commitments from companies. We are seeing a proliferation of net zero commitments, which is wonderful, and we applaud them. But we also want to understand that they're real and we want to be able to celebrate the companies who are actually achieving things. So the big challenge for us and the kind of step four of what we're doing in the Mission Possible Partnership is standing up frameworks whereby companies can track their emissions through the supply chain and demonstrate publicly that they're making progress against these targets. So I think with this approach, sort of moving an industry from let's get together and talk about the problem and some of the solutions into the roadmap of what needs to happen into the commitments according to that roadmap. And then finally, to the traceability, the tracking and some of those pilots that Rasmus talked about, I think will be truly transformational. And we're really hoping through the partnership to be able to kind of double down on some of that work. Thank you so much for that. And I apologize for um, taking a moment to actually pull up this slide. Um, 
It's, you know, I said at the beginning, I'm always finding new ways to have technological challenges. But here is the slide that you originally asked for, Kate, if you wanted to spend just a moment to say how this illustrates what you were just explaining. Sure. So this is the one that's the carbon budget slide. So thinking about the circle being the carbon budget that we have to remain within 1.5 degrees and looking outside of that circle and if we continue in business as usual in some of these heavy industries, how quickly we will exceed that. Um, so we're talking about exceeding that by 20% as soon as 2030 and by 250% by 2050. So this is just an illustration of the scale of the challenge that we have in front of us. And why now is the time when everyone is kind of coalescing around this approach to activate that ecosystem. Rasmus, you mentioned at the beginning how difficult it is to know where some of these emissions are coming from. How does the, the ability to track the emissions factor into this whole equation? And where are we in better understanding how to actually you know, connect specific emissions to specific processes and companies? So it's, there's a real mix out there, right? Um, but I think as Kate pointed out, you know, there's a, a big proliferation of uh, companies setting very high ambition. And I think what we've gotten to is the point where the companies realize there isn't, the easy stuff is gone, right? And we need to now tackle some of the harder parts. And with some of those harder parts, you know, when you're trying to calculate, you know, the carbon footprint of your product that you're going to sell to your customer. Um, first, it looks really complicated and it's going to take resources to do. So you don't really want to do it. Um, but then all of a sudden, now that we have so many companies setting net zero targets, um, the companies are demanding it. They're saying, hey, you know, I want to know what the carbon footprint is of your product before I buy it. And I'm going to actually judge, you know, um, your bids based on the carbon content. And so then we have like kind of a chain reaction starting, you know, from the, the customers who want to buy these products to the retailers, to the manufacturers of the products now into this kind of like B2B world. Um, and, um, and then you start to, you know, go about the process of trying to then, you know, actually do the calculations of your carbon footprints or life cycle assessments. And uh, you find some of the data quite easily, you know, the stuff that you're measuring already, like, uh, you know, if you're, you know, you've got sensors on, on, on some of your smokestacks and, you know, you know how many vehicles you have, how much fuel they use, so you can make those calculations. Um, you know, on your electricity bill, you've got pretty good information in most countries um, from most suppliers about what there is. Um, but then you get into, you know, that chain reaction. So then you need to start asking your suppliers, um, you know, like the car manufacturer, back in the day, the first kind of big announcements that were made was that they were putting solar panels onto their manufacturing sites. Yeah, great, you know, um, that's, you know, the obvious part where they're using energy. Um, but now it, the question is, we want the whole car, not just to be like, first of all, an EV, but we want it to have zero, you know, uh, embedded carbon. So then they have to think, well, where does my steel come from? So they ask the steel companies. Um, and the steel companies need to have an answer but even better than that, they need to have products that the customers want. So this is what we're seeing. And, and the part that I'm focusing on primarily in, in Mission Possible Partnership is this around like, how do you uh, send this demand signal all the way from the end consumers down the chain uh, in this B2B chain? And um, I think where we are right now is that it, it's kind of like a bit of a, a wild west, to be honest. Um, you know in terms of like how companies approach, you know, carbon footprinting and how they may be priced that into their products. Uh, what we need now is more of a, a globally standardized system, um, which gives comparable data so that you have a data point that you can actually negotiate over. It needs to become a normal part of the contracting and negotiation process for setting price, right? Um, and that's what we're very keen on in Mission Possible Partnership is to find a vector, essentially, to send that demand signal up the value chain and then send to trigger the investments um, in the decarbonized products to send those back down the value chain. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not going to lie. You know, we've got a lot of work still to do um, at the moment. If you want to look up, you know, some of the the carbon footprints of, of some chemical products or some steel, you have to go into some like academic databases at the moment, which have outdated, you know, average global values potentially. Um, we need to get into being much more specific, but luckily 
you know, tech is uh, catching up with this task at hand. And we've got some really exciting stuff we're doing as well with um, uh, basically blockchain, essentially, to be able to ensure that we have transparency and traceability. Is, is the, the appetite, appetite there for green products? products? I remember hearing a, a session a last year about hard debate, debate sessions, sessions, and there were some folks from Green Steel, and, and they essentially said that they weren't such a price-sensitive industry and that there was no real consumer demand or no appetite to be paying a premium for greener steel, that their hands were kind of tied. If they wanted to do things that they would, that their buyers would then just go to buy steel from China or something like that. I feel, I feel like, like we've come, come a little bit further when it comes to steel, but overall, is there when you're starting to talk about this, is the appetite really there for these um, these companies and these buyers? It is there, but it isn't big enough. I mean, that's why we're still working on this, right? Uh, through MVP by bringing together the the suppliers with the customers, but uh, but I've I've also been seeing you know some really good indications in the market you know um two years ago when you spoke to customers then they would say yeah we want the decarbonized version but it can't cost any more fine um but now you're starting to hear the customers saying well we're actually willing to pay a little bit more and i think that's also a recognition that you know the margins and the revenue per ton of co2 emitted are much higher at the end of the value chain, so in, in downstream. So a retailer is making much more money per ton of CO2 that they're emitting uh, compared to the upstream, uh, like a cement producer or a steel producer. And so this is the conversation that's happening now is like, how can we more equitably share that margin as it moves throughout the value chain? Um, and the other thing is that, you know, companies are positioning themselves They're They're, you know, any good supply chain manager is trying to figure out, like, how are they going to secure supply in the future? And when, you know, the European Union, for example, is talking about border, border carbon adjustments, you know, for materials that are coming into the European Union, you know, a company is thinking, OK, well, maybe I can't rely on that, you know, um, company, for example, in China, which has a higher emissions but a lower price, I'm going to be, have to be buying this in the future. Um, so there's, I think there's a recognition, a real recognition that you know, the downstream companies are going to have to pay for this. Uh, they, they made the commitment to be net zero, and they're realizing now what that actually means. It actually means that they have to start putting these contracts into place. Um, and trying to snap up some of the early innovators because also, you know, the supply isn't as big as the demand potentially could balloon into, hopefully, in the near future. And Sarah, just to add to that, I, I think that we cannot underestimate the role of government procurement in this arena as well. The biggest buyers of commodities in the world are governments, right? And you just think about the demand signal that the U.S. government alone could send by saying that it's all of its fleets that it purchases have to be made with green steel, right? or all of the bridges that it builds have to be using green cement. So I think that there is certainly a private sector poll. There's an interesting policy lever, as Rasmus mentioned on the quarter the carbon border adjustments. But I also think procurement is something that we're going to see be a sort of initial focus in Europe, um, likely in the US, I think, in the next four years, and then in some additional geographies as well. Yeah. And the way we've seen this play out in, in the past is that, you know, policymakers will only set rules for the things they think, you know, can be achieved. You know, they don't want to destroy jobs either, right? And close down factories completely. They want there to be a replacement. And so as, you know, lower carbon products come into the market and we see evidence of that and policymakers see evidence of that, then they will eventually slowly but surely bring up the floor as well of what it takes to be allowed to play. So, for example, this might happen at the federal level or even a subnational level, like a city level, where they say, well, we're yeah. going to put standards in for, you know, any new housing that is built. It has to meet, you know, these, you know, greenhouse gas emission um, criteria. There's also a debate going on right now about setting up different net zero goals from organizations and countries. Of like, there's this, this moment where all of these different organizations are saying, we have a new net zero goal, and um, Climate Hawk saying, this isn't enough, you're actually not on track to getting to where we need to be. So I'm curious, as you're starting things like this Mission Possible Partnership and these buyers clubs, how you're ensuring that you can actually reach the decarbonization goals that you're striving for and make sure that it's not part of a larger kind of 
PR strategy of different organizations? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, with, with the Mission Possible Partnership, um, we're, we're really working with the companies that are not just ambitious, but are showing that they're investing as well. They're, they're taking action, right? Um, and the point is, you know, to, to Kate's point is, we're not having nice conversations about what should happen. We're actually trying to hammer through some deals, for example. So if you look at the demand work, yes, we're working with policymakers. So we're speaking through the Clean Energy Ministerial to some key governments about what kind of commitment could they make by COP26 in terms of what they want to buy, right? Sending a really strong cycle. On the other end of the spectrum, we're doing like almost like hand holding in terms of deal making between suppliers and customers for offtake agreements. And in some cases, you know, creating smaller marketplaces as well, so that the people who are actually serious that they want to put their money where their mouth is, you know, can meet, you know, the right the right companies who can provide those supplies. And then somewhere in between, we're also then trying to send a much more broader, um, almost like a marketing uh, signal to the the suppliers in terms of yes, you know, there are hundreds of companies out there, and they've committed to you know X gigatons or X dollars of investments into wanting to find you know either green steel or, or green concrete uh, or, um, or sustainable aviation fueled uh, flights etc um, so you know i think there we don't have space in mission possible partnership for kind of observers um, and i think you know just the sheer peer pressure of seeing what all the other companies are doing is is um uh, can't be understated in terms of like what kind of impact it has on, on companies wanting to um, essentially put their money where their mouth is. We have one question from the audience on this topic too that I'd love to um, touch on before we, we move on to the last topic which is what are some good ways to encourage suppliers to decarbonize outside of directly helping them finance those activities? There, there's quite a few options actually and, and one of the things that um, you know watch this space one of the things that we uh, agreed across like all the sectors that seems to be needed and desperately is a business guide for procurement so exactly like you know um, is it better to for example you know wait greenhouse gas emissions in bids by 10% or 20%? What what kind of difference does that make? Or, or should you have a threshold, minimum threshold that like, if you don't achieve a certain threshold, you can't even actually bid for? Uh, uh, so these are the kinds of questions that companies are struggling with at the moment. But I think the, the clear, it almost goes in steps, right? The first step is to signal what it is that you want to buy in the future. The second step is to actually put that on paper as a requirement that, you know, and there it, it, you know, you can ratchet that up over time in terms of like how much weighting that criteria has. And then the, the fourth step is to actually invite your suppliers, especially your strategic like key suppliers into a conversation to essentially open up the challenge to them saying, hey, you know, and I've been part of these conversations, they're great, you know, where you sit down and think, well, this is the problem I'm trying to fix. Like, what solutions do you have already? Which ones are you maybe working on? And then, you know, which ones could we work on together? Uh, can we maybe bring in a university or somebody else as well to help us? Um, and then when it comes to finance, um, I mean, sure, you could like just hand out money, but I think we've seen some some kind of really interesting models as well. Um, I remember uh, one great example was um, a, a large retailer um, working with very small logistics companies, right? And those logistics companies didn't have the, the capital to be able to change their fleet into electric vehicles immediately, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so what they did was they essentially, you know, the retailer bought the vehicles and leased them to the smaller um, logistics companies. And in the contract, there's an agreement that I think it was like eight years or 10 years, then they, you know, after the lease agreement is over, they switch to ownership of these smaller companies. So, so I think there's some, some more sophisticated ways of, of also, you know, helping financially, you know, using the, the kind of the, the financial firepower, the weight um, of some of these bigger retailers as well. And, uh, and that's very much what we're, we're, we're looking for constantly is, is these more creative business models, right? 
this isn't just about technological innovation. And we've talked a little bit about policy innovation, not so much, but I think the really interesting one is also around the business model of innovation. Thanks so much. I'd love to move on to the last, um, the last question that I'd like to talk about today, which um, is, this wasn't the initial session that I had in mind when we started these conversations. Um, I was picturing us having a company on here talking about what they're doing in this realm, talking about the, the tough decisions they're making, how they're getting internal buy-in, how are they getting involved with other companies and starting to build these players clubs and get involved with organizations? And I couldn't that was able to talk about this. Um, I know that there's a few that are working on it that just maybe were too early to talk about it. Maybe some, you know, also stick into it probably, but I don't want to say no one's working on it. But this wasn't, this wasn't um, it, it, as easy as I thought it would be. And, and so, so I'm curious why all of you, like, like, we know that this is such a problem. problem. All, all of these companies, companies are trying to get out in front of, of decarbonizing their supply chain. chain. Yet here, here we are, and there still isn't anybody, anybody that's ready, ready to have this conversation. So, so I'd, I'd love to hear why, why aren't, aren't there more companies, companies further, further along, along in this process, process right, right now? now. So, so here, let's start with you. you. I mean, I think that there are a number of companies involved. There was to speak on panels like this, maybe limited. I mean, one of the things, it's a big risk for a company, right? It's a big risk for a company to go out with a net zero goal to begin with, because they're in general going to get hammered by NGOs who are telling them what's the meat behind that. And then being on a panel like this, talking about their experience is sort of a vulnerable place to be, right? So I think that we're going to see more and more companies willing to, to come forward and talk about their experiences wrestling with some of these problems. But since this is a really new area for collaboration, and a lot of these are bilateral conversations in the way that Rasmus described, right between supply and demand, it's tough to get them on, on short notice to, to participate in conversations like this. But Rasmus, I'd be interested in hearing your views on that too. Yeah, I, I'm, um, I've got a couple of ideas. Um, the one that I'm really hoping it is, is that they're so busy doing the work that, you know, they don't have time to come onto these kinds of panels. I mean, it, it and not, not being funny, I, I, it reminds me of like when myself, myself, like a few years back, like doing a lot of organizing panels. And one thing we could seem to never get was the startups, right? You know, and, and, and it was obvious why they couldn't come because, you know, you have kind of like a skeleton crew of people and everybody's doing like 10 jobs in that company. And so why would they fly all the way to like, I don't know, like Paris or to San Francisco, like to speak for 30 minutes and then fly back, you know, they lose two, three days. Right. Um, and, and so I think we've got the same problem here. You know, these people are head down, like doing the work. I mean, it's a bit of a distraction, you know, to be going around uh, doing these panels. But I think Kate, your point is also equally, you know, very valid this is this is hard and you know the easy answers are kind of in the public space already um and because it's hard because you need to find almost like tailor-made solutions for every situation right and you know you're not maybe at liberty to disclose you know a lot of the detail around um some of the things that you're doing and um, and then the last point I think, which is which is actually really positive thing, is that a lot of companies have embraced you know the the idea or or the inevitability that the business context that they're operating in or will operate in in the very near future is one where the low carbon solutions win, right? And you don't want to be giving away that competitive advantage, right? Um, so, you know, you're keeping some of the things, some of the big ticket items very close to your chest because you want to make sure that you are the winner in a future market where success is measured by how sustainable you are. And what can companies want to get involved and maybe aren't already 
actively working on this, which is why they were too busy to be able to have a conversation about it. What, what, what could they be doing right now? Where do, where do organizations get started? Well, it depends a little bit on, um, of course, the sector um, and, and what the role. But actually, most companies have at least a dual role, if not like a, a triple role. So the first is as a company who sells, you know, goods or services, right? So of course, what they could be doing is um, either working hard to deploy the technologies that they have, uh, or then um, developing new technologies, right? And one of the key things in that space, I think, um, what we've what we've seen a shift over the last kind of twenty years is that no company can do it on their own. There's a, a real realization that you have to have strong partnerships um, and also some very unconventional partnerships. So um, that's certainly one area where I think, you know, to speed up the rate of innovation, find the partners so you can get the products to the market. Then the other role that companies have is also as a customer. And so I think here it's important to signal to, um, to your suppliers what your future intent is. And one of the best ways to do that is to join some of these, let's say, global uh, initiatives like we've had on renewables, RE100, companies saying that they, they want to move to 100% renewable, sending a strong message. So we have that now as well for like Steel Zero. And through MPP, we're also working on Concrete Zero. So those are things where, you know, even just having your name uh, attached to that really helps. And then I think on the last part, it's, it's the advocacy, right? Um, you know, Policymakers uh, need to have the confidence that they can be more ambitious, and they get that confidence particularly from business, because business means tax revenue, it means jobs, it means you know, winning in the future marketplace, and um, and companies can definitely lend their voice to you know, helping policymakers see that the solutions are there, and there's a winning combination in terms of the future market, so we should invest in this, and um, and and really put the policy framework in place that would enable these sustainable companies, low carbon companies, to be the most successful. Kate, do you have anything to add about what organizations can be getting involved? I think Esma's covered it. I mean, come join the Mission Possible Partnership, right? I mean, I think the, the Mission Possible Partnership, I didn't describe it so great, well at the outset, but essentially it's a a number of organizations, we have over 15 different organizations, including the Women Business Partners, who are involved in kind of leveraging each other's expertise of sectoral decarbonization. So the, the point to our work is to really consolidate all the efforts focused on industrial decarbonization to really become a one-stop shop for companies who are wrestling with some of these problems. So as someone coming into the Mission Possible Partnership, we will put you in touch with the sector initiatives that Rasmus described, right? So Steel Zero, Concrete Zero, thinking through solutions in trucking, aviation, shipping, but also consider how we might be able to activate you in what we call some of our cross-cutting work. So the demand piece, finance, et cetera. So we take all comers um, who are interested in really wrestling with these solutions, but I will say that the key part that we're focused on right now in the partnership is really delivering on these industry back roadmaps. That is the key engagement from the ambitious companies to ensure that we have buy-in and we have a real trajectory that is exactly what the policymakers are looking for, as Rasmus described. So I think that this is going to be a really exciting um, lead up to COP for the partnership. Hopefully have some really exciting commitments that companies are able to, to come forward with there. But then the real work begins of implementing the solutions and then very importantly, tracking implementation of those solutions so we can make sure that we're troubleshooting, providing additional support, and really holding companies accountable for some of these net zero commitments they're coming forward with. So there are definitely other organizations working on these other buyers clubs and uh, what we're trying to do with Mission Possible Partnership is to map out, you know, who's working where on what. Um, they've been, you know, so, some some of the, the big ones are global and, and quite well known, um, but there's plenty of others which are more, let's say, local or regional. and. Um, 
And so, you know, it can be a bit of a confusing map for a lot of companies and, and even organizations like us to like know exactly what's going on. But, uh, but there's definitely uh, other ones that, that are out there. I mean, the ones that, you know, are in the limelight, so to speak, at the moment, um, which we're trying to channel a little bit more of the activity to, because um, you need to have consolidation and, and aggregation to be able to, you know, be impactful. Um, are particularly the the we business partners like Climate Group um, with the Steel Zero and Concrete Zero, like we just mentioned, but they also have EV100 and RE100. Uh, uh, BSR is also working on multimodal freight uh, together with the Smart Freight Center, and we've you know also asked them to essentially take the lead, uh, bringing in companies through throughout MPP on that. And the World Economic Forum is doing a plenty of work, particularly on the, the um, green public procurement space. So there's plenty of initiatives out there. And depending, of course, what kind of company you are, you might want to be going. Um, but you shouldn't shy away from the more global ones as well. Well, thank, thank you both for your time, time today. And thank, and thank you for bearing with me with my terrible audio issues. I, I, I do apologize. apologize. And, and I, I look forward, forward to, um, to, um, to Bridge Electrify 2022, 2022 when we're going to have so many organizations that are ready to tell their story about the path to decarbonizing the industry. So thank you both. And until next time. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you.